So while we're setting up, I'm going to make people multitask, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Who here knows what a Linux container is? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, pretty much everybody knows what a Linux container is. Who here has used any kind of Linux container? Okay, maybe roughly half. Well, okay, more than half. People are reluctant. It's a small group. We can, you can share. Um, and then who here has used Aptainer as your Linux container? Just two. Okay, okay. This gives me, okay, so I have a ton of different stuff here that we could talk about today, and I wanted to kind of gauge um, your level of, you know, where you're at so we can talk about the right things. Uh, so this gives me a good idea of where I should start to talk about this stuff. Also, you guys can drive the conversation, okay? If there are any specific questions you have, maybe you were in the course earlier and, you know, I, I was too fast and didn't cover something. If, you, if, you, if there's anything in particular that you want to talk about or any tests you want to run, any stuff like that, let's make this interactive since it's kind of a small session, okay? So based on the input that I got from you guys, I think what I'll end up starting with is basic usage of Aptainer. I'll kind of go through that fairly quickly. And then once we've got our feet underneath, we'll talk about building containers. Is that the kinds of things that you guys want to talk about? Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. And if at any point in time I'm going too fast or if I'm going too slow, please say, you know, hey, let's adjust the speed here. All right. Um, Is it possible, could you also delve into the uh, how kernel side of things that you were talking about in the seminar today? Yeah, yeah. So, th so, so you want to, so the question is, can we look a little bit more about how the kernel on the host system interacts with the kernel within the container? Yeah. Sure, we can do that. Okay. We, we can do that in the context of running containers. That would be a good thing that we could do. All right. Um, okay, so I've got an introduction here. I'm not going to go over it. Pretty much everybody knows what Linux containers are. Uh, you can basically conceptualize them as lightweight virtual machines. Okay, so we're going to skip on to the next. I will tell you that um, the course today is about Aptainer. And you might not have heard of Aptainer, or if you have, you might have also heard of Singularity, and you might know, you might not know like what Singularity, what's Aptainer. Basically, Singularity is what the project used to be called. A few years ago, we asked the Linux Foundation to uh, sponsor the Singularity Project, and they said, we would love to do that, but we want you to change the name. And so we changed the name to Aptainer. And so now, uh, what was Singularity is now Aptainer. It's pretty much that simple. Okay, so let's talk about downloading and interacting with containers. Um, so I'm going to try to follow pretty closely with this material so that you guys don't get lost and we don't get into different things. But, we, you know, we can kind of jump off and start talking about uh, kernel builds a little bit. Okay, so the very first thing you need to know is that you can always, if you have Aptainer installed, just run Aptainer help. And that will give you a list of all the commands that you can use. It will also give you some options and arguments. Um, that you can provide and, you know, some information about Aptainer. Um, but really, the meat is these different commands. So I want to pull a container. I don't have to pull a container to use it, but I want to show you what pulling a container looks like. And that's the first thing I want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and do an Aptainer pull. I actually want to just do help. Because if you're just learning containers, this is a great way to learn about these subcommands too, get an idea of what they do and you know how to use Aptainer. Okay, so if you look at the help, it basically says that pull is going to download or build a container. And you, you give it a URI of one of these forms. And you can also name the container if you want to, if you want to give it two inputs. So I'm pretty fond of using kind of a silly container, which um, doesn't really do much other than try to entertain you a little bit. And the reason I use that silly container is because I don't want you to focus too much on what's in the container. I want you to focus more on the container process itself. So let's go ahead and pull that container. 
Um, we're going to pull a container called LOL cow. We're going to call it LOL cow dot SIF. That stands for a singularity image format file. And we're going to pull that from Docker from my username, God love DC in this case. And the container is going to be LOL cow. All right. If you have the GitHub repo up that uh, has all the, the stuff in it, and you've got that kind of like beside your terminal or in another workspace or whatever, most of these commands, I'm going to try to follow that like as closely as possible because then you can just copy and paste the commands, okay? So, um, so has everybody got this typed in pretty much? We're going to go ahead and pull this container. And it's going to give us a bunch of warnings because we did this without any root privileges. And so it's saying, I have all these root owned files in here that I can't make root owned anymore because you are a lowly unprivileged user. And that's fine. That's okay. Uh, and then it's going to create a SIF file. So what's actually happening here? If you're used to using something like Docker or Podman or something, you might have seen a pull command before. And what um, Docker or Podman does is it goes up and it finds all the different layers that an OCI container comes in and it pulls them down and then it creates at runtime an overlay file system out of them and then it kind of hides that somewhere where you can go and find it using Docker commands. Aptainer is different. Aptainer goes and finds all that layer, all those layers that make up a container and it squashes them all down into one file system and it creates a file out of that. And then you can interact with your containers using that file if you want to. And so that's a kind of a fundamental difference between Aptainer and other container platforms. It's one of the reasons it's called Singularity, because it's a single file. So, um, so after you do this, you've got this new file uh, in your directory called lolcow.sif. And that is your container. It has inside of it um, a little operating system image with a, a new root file system. And it also has some metadata inside of it. Okay? How are we doing on the pacing so far? Is everybody pretty much following along up to speed? Am I going too slow? Cool. Okay. So now that we've got this, um, this, this container, we can do stuff with it. In fact, we could have done stuff with it even when it was still up on Docker Hub. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and just do stuff with it here. I'm going to try to stick pretty closely to this. Was there a command that you did just after it was creating the SIF file? Mm -hmm. Oh, you pressed enter? Well, I, I, I typed LL. What does that mean? Um, like, like, why? Why did you do that here? Yeah, you don't have to, but it's, uh, it's an alias of the command LS. And LS lists everything that's in your current working directory and dash L um, gives it to you in a long format. So it's an alias of ls dash L. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna go ahead and let's see. I'm gonna show you that you can also pull, so what we just did is we just pulled um, a container that was in OCI format. It was in the format that's recognized by Docker. You can also pull a container which is in straight singularity format from Docker Hub, assuming it's up there. So I, what is Docker? Docker is probably the most widely used Linux um, container platform. It, it, it's kind of waning. Now people use Podman instead of Docker. Um, but it, it was the one that kind of like popularized containers and made uh, containers in the cloud native space really popular. Um, yeah, so this is a great question, and this is something we can talk about too. I'm going to take a little detour, and we're going to talk about Docker for a couple minutes. Okay, so, um, okay, as I said, I, we, there was a previous lecture that some of the people who were here attended, and I said that the dirty little secret about containers is that they don't really innovate and create anything new. Instead, what they do is they take a bunch of features of Linux and kind of wrap them up in a, a single package and present them to the user in a way in which the user can use them, okay? Docker did that first. 
Before there was Docker, there were Chiroots, Chiroot environments, there were BSD jails, there were a bunch of other like little virtualization things, which were kind of containers, but they were really hard to use. And Docker said, okay, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna take all these tools and kind of put them together in something which is easier to use. And um, that kind of really, it became extremely popular, partially for, because it's ease of use and partially because it was like a right time, right place kind of thing. Um, web developers really needed a way to uh, create microservices out of these big architectures. We talked about this in the last course a little bit. Basically, it, it ushered in a new way for web developers to create applications. Yeah. Yeah, web applications and stuff like that, yeah. So, Docker was the most popular container format for a long time. And for several years, and then people in the HPC community started to be like, oh my gosh, Docker's awesome. Can we start to use that to run jobs in HPC? And uh, administrators like myself and others looked at Docker and said, this uh, assumes that you are going to have root privileges. It assumes that you're gonna be uh, a root user or that it's gonna be okay for you to have elevated privileges. So we can't install it and let users use it on the system. Um, Greg Kurtzer at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs looked at this and he said, we can't install Docker, but could we create a container platform that would work for HPC? And that was where Singularity started. Now, you're gonna hear me talk about OCI a lot. So, um, a few years after the, the Aptainer uh, platform was founded and started as Singularity at the time, um, there began to be a desire, mostly from the people in Docker, to standardize containers. And so they said, we're gonna start a consortium called the Open Container Initiative, or OCI. And we're gonna say, this is the new, cons this is the new standard for how containers should be stored and how they should be run. And by the way, the standard is gonna be based on Docker. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then they got um, a bunch of companies involved and they got um, the, the, the Linux, uh, some Linux uh, groups involved as well. And so the Open Container Initiative has become a standard. It has since kind of grown beyond Docker, but it's a, a standard for how containers should be stored as layers within tarballs, uh, commonly referred to as a bundle, for how containers should be run, so how the runtime should work, and how containers should be um, stored in a registry. So now there's an OCI standard for registries as well. Okay, that's a bunch of history. Um, and then, just so you know, Aptainer sort of predates the whole OCI thing, and it, it's not OCI compliant at all. The way the containers are stored, the way the containers are run, uh, and there is no, like, registry, well, no, there was a registry for Aptainer for a while, but none of that stuff's uh, OCI compliant. Okay, cool. So, when we're talking about this Singularity image format file, the SIF file, this is kind of like one of the ways in which is not OCI compliant, because the way in which you store containers according to OCI is you have a bunch of layers that are all in tarballs, and you have a manifest, and you take that, you take them and stitch them together into a container at runtime. All right, so let's go back. Now, you can actually download from an OCI registry SIF files, because you can push SIF files up to OCI registries. So if one of those exists, you can download one. So let's, let's look and see what that looks like. Um, I'm gonna issue this pull command again, but now I'm gonna change, and I, not instead of, instead of using Docker, I'm gonna use something called ORAS. ORAS stands for OCI Registry as something. <laughs> it's, it's basically a way in which you can, you can kind of use an OCI registry and just push arbitrary data to it. So now I have to give it the entire URI because the ORAS command is not quite so forgiving as the, uh, doc, or the ORAS transport is not as forgiving as the Docker transport. It doesn't assume Docker. Okay, so I have to say docker.io. And then further, I have to specify a tag. So a single image can have multiple tags. And uh, this is a way in which you can have like multiple different versions or you can have multiple different, you know, formats in this case of the single image. So let's do that. It's gonna say, I, I don't wanna do that because I'm gonna overwrite your work. 
I'm going to say dash F, oops, or dash dash force. I guess I do want you to do that. And then it's downloaded the ORAS image. From your perspective, nothing has really changed here, um, except now um, you've gotten a native ORAS image, and you can do things with it that you wouldn't be able to do with a, with a Docker image. You can do things like verify that the image has been signed, oops, which it hasn't in this particular case, but you can do stuff like obtainer inspect def file, and then you can actually get the definition file out that was used to create the image. So I'm kind of jumping off the script here a little bit, but this is why you would want to use an ORAS image instead of just a, a straight up uh, OCI image. Okay. So this is just, and sorry, I, I am really getting off the script. I apologize. Um, but this is just, um, you know, this is just how you get an image. Now that we've got it, let's do things with it, okay? So I'm going to give you the most simple um, container demo that I can think of. I'm sorry, Etsy OS release. So I'm going to look at the contents of a file um, on, the, uh, on the operating system called Etsy OS release. And that file is going to tell me what is the operating system that I'm running. I'm running Rocky. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and do an Aptainer shell lolcal.sif. I'm going to shell into that container image. When I do that, my prompt is going to change. Cool. That lets me know that I'm in a new image now. And I can do a cat Etsy OS release again. And ta-da, I just swapped out my operating system from Rocky to Debian. And that's containers in a nutshell. Containers allow you to take an application and package all its dependencies, and I mean all its dependencies, down to the entire operating system, and then run that, that application anywhere because it's got all its dependencies with it. And this is how it does it. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and exit that container, and then I'm going to show you really quickly some other commands that you can do with Aptainer. So I just shelled into the container and executed a command um, manually. Let me just make sure this is what I'm supposed to be doing next. Oh, actually, I was supposed to tell, show you. Hold on, I'm going to shell back in. And I'm going to say, who am I? And I'm going to say, host name. And I'm going to say ID. Okay, now if you guys have used Docker or Podman or any of the other container solutions, Run C or whatever, all the other ones that are out there, this should be surprising you. Um, you are the same user inside the container as you are outside the container. And the host name is the same inside the container. And in fact, you have the same UID and GID inside the container as you have outside the container. And that's a core kind of like architectural decision that Aptainer makes. Um, on your behalf, it basically writes entries to Etsy password and Etsy groups, um, or Etsy group, when you go into the container to make sure that you're the same inside and outside. And that makes reading and writing files from the host system trivial. Okay. It, it also underlies the entire security posture, <laughs> by the way. It's like what makes Aptainer containers secure. So it's kind of a kind of a big deal that that's the way that Aptainer works. Okay, um, I'm going to go back into the container. I keep popping out, and I'm going to execute a command called calse, and I'm going to say calse moo. And when I do that, you're going to see a cow, and the cow is going to say moo. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm also going to run. Pay no attention to Rose Stein. I'm going to run Fortune, and Fortune is going to tell us some random Fortune. Okay, it's going to it's going to select from a, a library of Fortunes that it's got, and it's going to tell us you know some Fortune. Then I'm going to run Fortune. I'm going to pipe that into Calse, and then I'm going to pipe that into another program called LOLCat. Okay, 
And now we arrive at the ultimate purpose of this container. Okay, it is to create colorful cow fortunes. Yes. So class is dismissed, we're done. No, but the point is, when you downloaded this container, you got access to these programs. If you exit the container and you say, cow say moo, <laughs> it's going to say, bash command not found. I don't know what you're talking about. So when you downloaded this container, you got access to these programs. And that, in HPC, is what containers are all about, right? I, I, um, this other lab that I really admire has created this program that I want to run to analyze my data. But I go to their GitHub repo and their readme says, the first thing I need to do is sudo apt-get install these 10 programs as dependencies. And then pip install whatever, you know, for them. And I'm sunk because I can't use sudo. I don't have apt-get install on my, you know, Rocky Linux cluster, obviously. So what can I do? I can go to my admin and I can pray that maybe they've got a solution and I can hope that they'll install it on my behalf. Or I can say, that's easy. I'll spin up a container with Ubuntu in it or with Debian in it. I'll be root inside the container and I'll run apt-get, you know, and I'll install those dependencies and pip install the application and I'll just run it. And next time I need it, I'll just move it to a new cluster and run it. Or better yet, I'll just go up to Docker Hub and I'll see where somebody from their lab has already containerized it. And I'll just download that container and run it. Easy as that. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the entire purpose behind containers here. All right, so so far we've just shelled into the container and done stuff manually, which is really lame. We don't want to do stuff manually in HPC. So let's, let's um, try some other stuff. Let's exec a command. So exec says, give me the name of a container and give me the name of a co command and I will go into that container and execute that command and then pop back out. And then another way to interact with containers is to run them. So I'll just run this container. Now, this is a little tricky. What happens when it just runs a container? Well, it turns out that there is metadata inside the container that says, this is what should happen if you just run me. Okay? And because Aptainer containers are single files, which is pretty cool. They're executable. So if I just do an LL and I look at this, uh, this file, holy cow, <laughs> no. it's, it's executable. So I can just execute it. So I can just do this. And there you go. It runs. All right, so that is basic Aptainer look and feel and action commands and how to download them and stuff. Um, there is, yeah, container, uh, running containers. There's some stuff here on pipes and redirection. I'm going to skip that. The punchline from all that is that they work the way that you expect them to. You can pipe stuff into the Aptainer command and it'll actually, the input will actually go into the container and go through the program and you can pipe it back out, which is not actually quite as interesting. It just works. Um, and then I showed you a little prequel here. I did this inspect command. I showed you that you can container inspect, or not container, what am I doing? Aptainer inspect def file lolcow.sif, and it'll give you the definition file, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, that was used to build this container. What if we do something else? What if we do aptainer inspect run script? What the heck is a run script? Well, a run script is that metadata that I was talking about earlier that actually tells the container what it should do when it runs. And in this case, it's exactly that command that we just executed earlier. It's just fortune piped into calsay piped into LOL cat. So that's how the container knows what it's supposed to do when it runs. Okay. Um, Um, I don't think lolcat works like that. Okay. Um, you'd have to, you could say echo 
XYZ pipe to LOL cat. Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to, yeah. Because if you just said XYZ, what, so bash is going to say, there's a command X, Y, and Z in LOL cat that you want me to run. It's going to say, I don't know what X is, so I can't do the rest of it. Yeah, let me just show that instead of telling you. So if I shell back into the LOL cat dot So if I did X, yeah, let's just do it all as one. X, Y, Z, LOL cat, whoop, I don't know. But if I do echo, which is a command, X, Y, Z, and then I pipe that into LOL cat, that's proper, um, that, that's, that's proper uh, bash syntax. All right. Um, I'm trying to think, um, I don't know if uname is, in, yeah, it is. So uname is in this container. So now we're going to talk about kernels, my friends. So, okay, so uname dash, I think it's what, dash A? Like that? No. I was right the first time. I should have just trusted my fingers. Okay. Um, this is the kernel that we're running. It's got this little cloud stuff in it because we're running a kernel. This is this is a GCP instance. If you don't, if you didn't, you know, already hack into it and figure out what it was and take over our account or whatever. But that's what this is: is a GCP instance. Um, and so it's running this version of the kernel, which has been specifically built for cloud. And that's in the container, right? If we exit the container and we run the same command again, it's the exact same kernel. And this is the major difference between containers and virtual machines. Okay, a virtual machine, um, it starts off by virtualizing the hardware itself and then has a kernel that runs on top of that and controls the virtual hardware. And then on top of that, you've got your file system and your applications and all that stuff. Containers dispense with all that. They just say, I assume that this host has got some hardware and a kernel and I'm just going to grab that and I'm just going to slap a, a file system on top of that and that's going to be my container. And that's why you can start a container like that why it runs like immediately and why it's very performant, why containerized applications run at the same speed as bare metal applications, because they're just using the same kernel and the same hardware. So you had the question about kernels. So let me ask you, is that is there anything else that you want to talk about about kernels and containers? So I did have one thing. You know, you spoke about some uh, tasks and say programming languages like Python that execute faster than you use containerized applications. Is that because of multi-threading single-threaded tasks? No, that specifically has to do with I.O. Uh, um, so input and output operations. And it's it, not related to hardware at all? N well, it kind of is because it's specifically related to I.O. as it pertains to a network file system. So you only see those kinds of I.O. bottlenecks when you're running on a network attached you know, like a big parallel file system in HPC. And you see that because there's this server that sits in front of the file system that handles all the data operations. And when it has to handle a zillion of them all at once, it starts to bog down. It's a VM. It's a virtual machine running on top of a hypervisor on top of GCP. So this, this, yeah, this software stack is actually, there's some hardware somewhere in probably maybe Ashburn, Virginia. Huh? And you have containers inside that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and actually you'd have trouble. Um, I don't know if you could run a virtual machine here mm. uh, because this is not bare metal. This is a VM running, you know, that's how like cloud instances almost always are managed. Is you've got a bunch of hardware, but you don't actually run the OS on top of the hardware. You run hypervisors on the hardware and then you give your users VMs. And um, that's, you know, you might, they might have some shim which allows you to run VMs inside of VMs. I, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it's, it would probably be problematic. But containers, yeah, they can run VMs just fine. That's easy. In fact, <laughs> um, containers, they're only a Linux thing. And some people, like, they tear their hair out when I say that because they're like, I've got Docker on my Windows machine. I run Docker on my Mac. And I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, but... Little do you know that Docker installs a little lightweight virtual machine on your 
uh, Windows machine or on your Mac, and then it spins up your container in that virtual machine because now it's got a kernel. It doesn't have a kernel otherwise. And um, containers rely on kernel features, Linux kernel features in particular. They're not native to any other operating system. Oh, well, I was thinking more like x86 versus ARM. Yeah, that too. That too yeah. yeah, so that's a problem. You've got to have containers which match that architecture. Right. Yeah, there's no, there's no like virtualization layer that can say, oh, well, I'll translate one instruction yeah. set to another, and it'll be really slow, but at least it'll work. No, that doesn't, that doesn't work at all. So you can't run on con containers on M1 and then like export them to... Um, no. Um, and uh, another issue... Um, so you can, um, so we're getting into the weeds now, but I like this. This is like, I like that you guys are driving the, the, uh, discussion here. So the, the kernel, um, kind of controls the hardware and stuff. And then on top of that, you've got a set of C libraries, which are like primitives that let you, um, let you interact with the kernel. And th these are called in Linux land, the GNU C libraries, or glibc for short. And there is, th those don't have to match exactly. There are, you can run a different set of versions of glibc with a different set of kernels. But that is, that set is not infinite. So um, whenever a new kernel is released, there is pretty much guaranteed backward compatibility with whatever other glibcs have already been created. And that way you can update your kernel without breaking your system. But the opposite is not guaranteed. You can't necessarily take a really old kernel and run a really new glibc on top of it. And you'll run into this in HPC. Sometimes you'll be running on a system that has an ancient operating system on it because they don't want to update because things work. And you grab the latest, greatest Ubuntu um, and you slap that on your, your HPC system and all of a sudden you get these glibs. It's very nice. They, it actually gives you glibc errors. It actually says your glibc is, is too new. I, I don't know what to do with it. Um, but yeah, so you can run into that kind of uh, mismatch between um, your, your uh, container and your host operating system. Um, there's LSPCI, which will give you um, hardware which is at attached to the, the motherboard through the PCI bus. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's LSCPU, which will give you information about the CPUs that are running. I'm sure there's commands too to query, you know, what kind of memory you've got and stuff like that. I don't know them off the top of my head. But those, those will probably, those are low level enough that they will probably be installed inside the container that you run. Uh, I don't, we could test it, but they should, they should return the same whether we're in the container or we're out of the container. Uh, so just LSPCI real quick. Nope, that's not even. Oh, LSCPU? There we go. LSPCI might be an SBIN. Pseudo LSPCI. No, really? Uh, sudo DNF. I'm not going to pursue this for too long, but I'll look. Uh, user SBIN, base OS. Okay. It's probably not going to be inside the container, so it's a it's a it's a moot point. Um, wait a minute. User sbin ls. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I'd have to look around a little bit and figure out how to install that. But yeah, the the um, CPUs here. If we shell into the container. LS CPU, yeah, it's going to give us the same, same information. Okay. Um, 
Now, we could start talking about building containers. Where's my clock at? There we go. How much time do I have? Do we just have 15 more minutes or do we have? Oh, we got an hour, okay. Um, so we could start talking about building containers. So I've got this information here about OCI registries. Uh, there are a lot of different OCI registries, not just Docker Hub. There's also like um, uh, Harbor is another one. There's um, NVIDIA's got one. Uh, there are every cloud has got their own registry. You know, Google Artifact Registry or AWS has a you know, and some of them you need to authenticate to. There's ways to authenticate. Uh, I would basically just point you to the documentation um, and say, you know, to get information about how to authenticate, how to pull, and also how to push to registries. And um, you should also know that containers have tags and that there is a special tag called latest. And if you don't give your container a tag, it typically just gets the latest tag. And if you don't specify what container you pull, you get the latest tag. And that can, that you can get into trouble doing that because it's not reproducible. Latest always gets overwritten whenever somebody puts a new container up. So you can pull the same container twice within the span of a few minutes and get two different containers if you're not careful. And if you want to be really specific, you can get into SHA sums and stuff and pull your containers by that. But um, I would suggest that you check out the documentation on that topic. Um, let's talk a little bit about building containers. And then maybe if we can get through this quick, maybe we can get into some other fun. Well, let me ask you guys, do you want to talk about building containers or do you want to talk about another fun thing I could talk about is how to um, how to put your containers together as though they are applications and how to run containers as though they're applications. And another fun thing I could talk about is like how to manage multiple different containerized applications and present them to the user as though they're just there. Uh, but that would, t we would get into building a little bit when we talked about that stuff. So I'll let you guys choose your own adventure. What do you want? Second and third. Second and third. What, is there, does people agree? Or do you want to talk about building containers? I think we're going to cover, you want to talk about building containers. No, we can start with that and then branch off. I don't know if we'll have enough time. Um... Okay, I'll give you a crash course on building containers. How's that? You ever use a Docker file, Docker file to build a Docker container? It's the same but different. You use a, you use a, a definition file uh, to build a singularity container. The syntax is a little different. Instead of having like all those capitalized yelling at you words in front of everything, you just have different sections. I mean, other than that, that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. You can, there's more complicated things that you can do. Once again, there's, there's good online documentation. Um, yeah, but let's do something more fun. Okay, so. For random statistic, how many container, average app container, containers do you think are built in a day versus used in a day? Oh, 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 I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but that's, that's a good um, question because when Abtainer containers were new, and I was at the NIH, as I didn't give, you, I didn't introduce myself to you guys at all. Um, I, I did in the previous thing. I'm sorry. I'm Dave Godlove. I used to be a neuroscientist. I used to work at the National Institutes of Health. Then I became interested in high performance computing. I did that for a while, and then I got interested in containers, and I'm doing that now. Um, so that's a, really quick. So when I was at the NIH, and container technology first came out we started to document it for the users because we're like building this and stuff and putting it on the system. And I assumed when we're documenting this, the first thing every user is gonna to have to do is build their own container. And so we had a big section at the beginning of the documentation about building your containers and how to do it and yada yada. And before we actually got to the like running container stuff that I just went over. And after a couple of years, it became apparent that most users don't build their own containers. They just grab them already pre-built from Docker Hub and run them. And so we ended up taking that whole documentation and just turning it upside down and then just having like almost like a footnote at the bottom. Like, by the way, if you have to build your containers, here's how you have to, you know, here's the way to do it. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, um, and part of that is because um, here at Stanford University, we had a collaborator who worked in the medical school who was awesome, 
by the name of Vanessa Socket, and she said, oh my gosh, there's all these containers up on Docker Hub already. Wouldn't it be awesome if Aptainer could leverage those? And so she wrote a bunch of Python code in a very short period of time to make that happen. And all of a sudden, Aptainer was able to leverage all these hundreds of thousands of containers that already existed. So that was like a huge contribution. So yeah, right here at Stanford. Cool, awesome question. Um, let's talk about uh, a few different concepts and how we can use them for data analysis. Okay, I'm gonna gloss over building containers for the time being. Um, I'm gonna introduce really quickly a concept called bind mounting, okay? Um, you, you don't have to follow along with this, just watch what I do. Okay, so I touch, I touch a file called foo. I shell into the container. I look for what files I have. I still have a file called foo. It's still owned by me. This is extremely confusing if you're used to Docker. Used to Docker. I touch another file called bar. I exit the container. I do ls-l and I still have foo and bar. And they're still both owned by me and all that. And so the reason that this works is because Aptainer does not try to fully containerize your environment. It tries to do something that we call intelligent integration, right? What it says is, um, I know you're an HPC person and you're gonna wanna read data off the host and write data back to the host. So I'm gonna take a, some, a few special directories and bind mount them into the container from the host system at runtime so that they still appear to you within the container. One of those special directories is your home directory, another one is temp, and then there are a few like proc, sys, uh, dev that are important for just the operation of the container itself. So that's the magic, it's called bind mounting. You can control that. You don't have to have that happen if you don't want to. You can turn it off with this flag called contain, or if you want to bind other directories, you can do it with the bind flag. Okay, so those are, the, and you can do like another and another, and you can control that with an environment variable. Okay, so that's a crash course into bind mounting. Not in root, not in root's home directory. Oh. And that's, yeah, and that's, <coughs> there's, that's a little bit special um, as far as uh, root is concerned. So um, if, you, if you ran the container as root, then you could see the files there uh, in, your, in your home directory as root. Um, but you don't wanna run containers as root. Um, if you are not root when you run the container, you probably don't have the permissions mm -hmm. to, to see what's in root. Right. Yeah, so. Your home directory, yes. Uh, like That's what I just did. This worked because I'm in my home directory. So that's how I was able to see foo and then create bar from within the container and still see all those things. But if I did uh, shell and then contain, and then I did an ls-l, I don't see those files anymore. What happens if I say contain is that Aptainer just, I think what actually it does is it creates a new home directory that's just like a blank directory and it by mounts that in and pretends it's your home directory. So I don't think, so if you installed, this is a problem with uh, OCI containers, if you installed a bunch of stuff in the, in like, let's say you created some user and you inst installed a bunch of stuff in the home directory, then that wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to see that from within the container. Even if you had the same UID on the host system and you had the same home directory, um, you wouldn't be able to see it because your home directory gets bi-mounted on top of what's there already. So yeah, you run into issues with that kind of stuff. Um, so just another follow-up, uh, this home student directory, when is that created? That's created uh, uh, when you use the user add or add user command to create a user on the host. Okay. So, so, Backing up, I created a Google 
um, image. I created a, a, a like, a, like a, a, a golden image, pretty much, a Google VM. And then I issued a command to start 150 instances of that in a loop on Google. And so that's what you're running in. And so when I created that image, I made a root user, I made a password, I you know, made sure that SSHD would allow you to SSH in with a password and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's the environment we're running in right now. Okay. All right, so now you know about bind mounting and you know about building containers so we can do this other cool thing. Um, do we still have the LOL cow? Yeah. All right, let's create, let's remove foo oh, and bar. Let's create another file, okay? I'm going to, actually, let me follow the script. I think that we're gonna do something in data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's sudo make dear data. Okay, we're making a directory at the root of the file system, which we don't have permission to do without sudo. So we did it with sudo. And let's um, sudo uh, chmod, and we'll do 777, super secure. Okay. <laughs> So what am I doing here? Mm. No, I'm making, yes, well, it, has, it is setting it executable because directories have to be executable for you to see what's inside of them. But I made a new directory at the root file system called data and I made it readable and writable by everybody on the system. That's what that chmod777 did. Okay, so now anybody can read to or write from this slash data. So you could think of this, if you're in your HPC uh, environment, as maybe Scratch. Maybe you've got some Scratch space where you, you tell your users you can use it during your jobs, but don't be upset if somebody else overwrites it. Don't store anything there that you don't want anybody else to see because it's open to everybody. Okay, now let's make, a, let's make some data in our, in our uh, slash data directory. I'm, you can do whatever you want here. I'm going to echo a word called that is happens to be Wootini. And I'm going to say, I'm going to echo that to slash data java.txt because if you're a Star Wars fan, you know that Java's say Wootini a lot. Okay, so now if I cat data, and you can, you can put whatever text you want in there, but make a file, call it something, and echo some, some text to it, and put it in slash data. Okay, so now this is like you're a researcher, and you've got data in a shared directory, and let's say you want to analyze this data. In this case, all we want is we want our CalSay program to run on it so that our cow ends up saying Wootini. That's going to be our analysis. But you can imagine that you've got a file that you need to run an analysis on and then you need to produce an output. Okay, so one way you could do this is you could say apptainer, actually, I'm sorry, you could say cat data java.txt, pipe that to apptainer exec lol cow cow say and then we want to save that in a file. So we could redirect that output to data wcow, wtinicow.txt. I'll let you digest that for a second. So what we're going to do is we're going to take data java.txt. We're going to feed that into our container, do analysis on it. And then we're going to save the output into data wcow.txt. And in fact, that's not gonna work if you've, if you've hit enter already. It's gonna say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see no data directory. So you gotta do a bind data. And now from inside your container, it can actually see that data. This, in essence, so now I've got a new a new file called data, 
or data dot wcal, and if I cat data wcal, cal saying Wattini. I analyzed data through a container. So this, in essence, is how you use containers to read in input, perform some analysis, and then save some output. However, that's ugly as sin, right? That, like, who can remember all that? That's just terrible. So, let's rebuild our container and let's make it um, analyze the data for us. Let's, let's uh, actually use some of the features of Aftainer a little bit. Okay, so, I'm gonna see if I can do this. Um, let's see how well I can do this just from memory or just from figuring stuff out. <clears throat> I'm gonna do an Aptainer inspect def file lolcal.sif and I'm going to redirect that into lolcal.def cool now I've got my def file is there any difference between a single uh, caret thing versus two there is the good question if it's a single caret it overwrites anything that's already there if it's two carrots it um it appends output to it. So I'm going to go into lolcow.def and look at it. Okay, and this is the part where understanding definition files would have come in. But for this, for our purposes, we're just going to look at this run script. All right. And I am going to rewrite this run script. Oh, <laughs> I should have told you. Um, I typed vim <laughs> and then the name of the run script. You might want to do nano instead. Um, if you already did vim and you need help exiting out of vim in a few seconds, let me know and I'll help you. That was my fault because I did that. But you probably should have used nano. That's my bad if you're not, if you don't, if you're not a vim user. All right, so now... I'm going to rewrite this run script and I'm going to say cat um, dollar sign one. That's the first input that this run script gets. Feed that into CalSay and output whatever I get to dollar sign two. Now, in the manual that I've got, that I've showed you, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I actually do a little bit of really bare bones error checking in my um, run script, but it could be as simple as this. So let me just, I'm gonna double check because I'm, I wanna make sure that I actually get this right. If I can find it. Yeah, so that if, where is it? Am I, am I even in the right? Is this the right file? I, I saw an if somewhere. Yeah, but that if is just doing error checking. And we're not going to make any errors, so I think that's okay. Uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to cat dollar sign one into CalSay and then I'll put that to dollar sign two. So all this is doing is it's saying if the number of arguments is not equal to two, then echo, hey, give me the right input and output and then exit with an error. That's what that's saying. Um, you know, that's nice, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna type all that out right now. Um, escape colon X, if you were in Vim, and that'll save and, and exit. Is anybody stuck in Vim? Okay, just uh, hit enter. Don't touch anything else, hit escape. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, use nano instead. So hit escape, then make a colon, mm -hmm. then hit Q. It's gonna say no right. So you can hit escape again, colon, Q, force with bang. There you go. And then hit nan type nano, and then that's it'll give you instructions at the bottom. It'll say here's how you use nano. Oh, man. 
Rocky. What's wrong with you, Rocky? All right, sudo dnf install nano. Yes? Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys, what, what time is this class over? So uh, we still have, oh, cool, okay. My, my computer is still on the wrong time zone, it's still on the East Coast, so. All right, so I'll give you guys a second to edit that file. Oh, I should show you the file. Yeah, so just make it like this. I'll circulate and check your work. <laughs> All right, yeah, if, if you need any help, just let me know. And I guess let me know too when you're ready to go. Just All right, how are we feeling with thumbs up? Okay. All right, if we're not thumbs up, it's okay. You can watch what I do and be assured that it, it would work for you too. All right, so now if I've done this properly, I can just run lolcow.sif. I can give it the location of some data. And then I can give it the location where I want it to save the data. I'm going to say data2.txt. And it'll say, there you go. Uh, it will not work. It will be upset. And the reason is because, um, well, there's two reasons. Uh, sorry, number one, got to rebuild the file. So I, I haven't actually rebuilt the container. We're still running with the old container. Sorry about that. So let's do an apptainer build force, because we want it to overwrite our existing container. lolcal.sif, lolcal.def. It's what? Oh, it shouldn't be compiling anything. No, it's actually, so what's actually happening here is it's just downloading pre-compiled binaries. So the first thing it does is it downloads, in this case, I think an Ubuntu base container from Docker, and then it steps into that Ubuntu base and uses apt-get to download pre-compiled binaries from the mirror and just puts those in the right places. It's not compiling anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not right now, I can't, but yeah, I can scroll up. It's apptainer build, <clears throat> here we go. Force, because I'm overwriting a container which is already there. Do you have an lolcow.def file? Okay. Um, um, you could just watch for now. Um, yeah, and then w you can pick back up if we, yeah, when we go to the next section, you'll be able to pick back up again. Um, I was down on the building part. So uh, when we, like, when the old version, which was already built in this, it was referring to the previous definition file, right? Yes. Yeah, so when we're build building it again, why is it like fetching all the binaries again? Because it has to rebuild the entire thing from scratch. 
So it has to execute the entire definition file. This is also different from Docker in which you've got like, um, Docker has different layers. And so it's intelligent enough to say, oh, if I ran these commands, these layers would be unchanged. So I'm not going to do anything to those. I'm just going to pick up at this command where stuff is going to start to change. and It's going to change that. Abtainer doesn't do that. Abtainer builds everything from scratch because it's all in a squashed file system where it's, it's actually um, it's a compressed file system where you can't even like look at the files in it without actually mounting it up and doing all that. Okay, so now if I've done my job right, I should be able to do this command. And it's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about because it doesn't know what data is. So I can do abtainer bind path equals data. So this is the environment variable that I was telling you about. I just mentioned existed earlier that you can use to set your, your bind path. We did that with a bind command before, yeah. we, uh, bind equals. So this is the same as saying bind equals, oh. but now I'm saying any container that I run after this environment variable is set, just pretend I said bind equals slash data. Oh, okay. And this is, we're gonna have to do it this way now because we're actually executing the container with this syntax, so we don't have the opportunity to pass command line arguments. And so this should be silent because it just created a file called slash data, slash data two dot text. Not very imaginative, I apologize. And so let's stop for a second, get out of the weeds, and get up higher level and look down at what this, what this is, what we're doing. We have a containerized data analysis program within our lolcow.sif file. And now we can run it as though it's a command and we can give it input, which does not exist inside the container. It only exists on the host system. And we can give it output, a place to save the analysis. And it, it works. So if you containerize your applications in this way, you can kind of forget they're containerized. And you can just use them to run your analysis the way you would any other command. So that's kind of like the high level summary of what we've accomplished by changing the run script and uh, using this, this uh, apptainer bind path environment variable. So this is kind of, we're now trending toward the way people actually use containers in HPC. Yep. So if I, if I basically force this container on a server and I expose an IP address, I essentially create an API. If, yes, if um, the, hmm. Yeah, you could do that, but you would have to be able to curl the IP address and get it to run an apptainer command. You could probably do that. So, so if you have a web server or some sort of a you know, web application or something running inside the container, um, then yeah, that will work. And that's actually, people do this with Jupyter Notebooks, right? They install Jupyter Notebook inside of a container run it containerized and then just expose the IP address and the port and which happens automatically and then just connect to it. Um, a web app inside a container? Yeah. You can run like Nginx inside your container oh, for yeah, instance. Yeah, and then you can connect to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't understand exactly what bind part is going to say here. Because it solved the error we were getting, right? A couple of clients ago. So what did it exactly do by how did it actually solve the error? Yeah, okay, I'll show you. So let's, let's unset apptainer bind path. And I'm going to do an apptainer shell lolcow.sif. I'll do an ls-l of data. There's no such thing. Let me get out of here. Reset the apptainer bind path. Shell into the container again. Uh, 
skipped it. ls dash l data, and it's there. And it, it is the same directory which is on the host. It's just when it created the container, it took that directory which was on the host and it bind mounted it into the container. Okay, so virtual storage kind of thing. Uh, it's more, it's not really, vir it's, it's, it's the same storage, it's not virtual. It's the same, so uh, it's basically, uh, they're both actually in the same part. Yeah, under the hood, what's happening is complicated um, mount commands. So, I'm sorry, every time, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, every time, um, every time you start a container, the first thing that it does is it mounts a new file system. It's actually much more complicated than that it does a whole series of mounts because it mounts the file system and then it mounts, it goes through some contortions to mount your data directory onto the file system that it just created. And then it goes through some like unmount nonsense and it keeps doing that until it builds up this entire new file system, which actually doesn't exist anywhere, but it does out of all these mounts that it just created. And so when you um, pass the bind uh, environment variable or the CLI option, you're controlling that process and you're saying here are some more uh, mounts that I want you to make from one place on the file system to another to make it appear that it's part of this new root file system. They're the same files, yes. And they're not, there's no copy, there's no virtualization, there's no um, sim links or anything like that, it's just the same files. And in fact, you can do stuff too, like this. Um, you can bind that to something different with a colon uh, syntax. So I can say, I'm gonna bind that to something called new data. And then if I enter my container, there is no data anymore, but there's a directory called new data, and it's got the same you know, it's got the same files in it. It's, yeah, it's not, it's not a sim link, it's not a hard link, it's nothing like that. It's actually, these are the files. They're just, they're just bind, so you can bind um, a directory, or I'm sorry, you can mount a directory just like a file system from one place to another, and that's all it's doing, it's just remounting it. Yep. All right. It won't be there, yeah, yeah. That, good question, but yes, that's, it's still data. So if I try new data. Yeah. Uh, Same as there, I guess you created the one with root. Yeah, that was, we, we um, as, as root users mm -hmm. in the root file system, we created the slash data directory. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or you can, or you can just, or you can just use the syntax slash data. Yeah. The, yeah, you can just say slash data without the colon new data. You can just say slash data and then it'll, it'll appear there. That's what we did the first time. Oh. Yeah. yeah. If we don't bind it, we won't be able to access it. Right. It, unless it's in your home directory. Your home directory is special. An Aptainer by mounts that by default in for you. You mean the environment variable? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just part of the environment. So if we type env, you've got all these environment variables which are set up for you. Uh, some of them just based on bash, some of them based on some different configuration files that you have. Some of them might be in a special file called your .bashrc in your home directory. And so these are in memory. These are not saved in any file anywhere. They just configure your environment, basically. So I could do, so I've got an environment variable we'll call it PS1, for instance. So I could do echo PS1. Oh, that's not right. Specify that it's an environment variable and echo its value. That's what my environment variable PS1 does. 
What does that do? Well, let's save it. So I'm gonna say export old PS equals PS1. Now I've got an old PS environment variable that says that, okay? So if I echoed that, you'll see that. So I just saved the value of my PS1. And now I'm gonna say export PS1 equals that. PS1 controls my prompt. And so now my prompt is just a dollar sign. And it doesn't have all that other stuff about me being student, adaptainer class, yada, yada, yada. This is shorthand for telling it to say user at host name and then the, the directory that I'm in, the working directory, and then give it a dollar sign. So then if I say export PS1 equals the value with the dollar sign of old PS, I got my prompt back. And so environment variables do all kinds of stuff internally. Um, they can control programs like we just, we just saw with Aptainer, or they can control bash. Um, that's, all, that's, a whole, that's a whole thing. So your environment is environment variables are all shared across container and the host? No. <coughs> um, environment variables are not shared. Uh, environment variables actually from your, from your current environment do go into your container unless you specifically tell them not to. But you can use the contain all option to say for them not to go into your container. Um, if you, so I did an export of the environment variable right there. If you don't export it, then child processes don't inherit those variables. So if I start a new process from this process, it doesn't get that same environment. In your class, yes, Chirrut is an environment variable. Chirrut is more than that, though. Um, Chirrut is kind of what I was telling you about in the class. So we talked a little bit in the class about the architecture of Aptainer and what it does. And I went through the very first thing, maybe not the very first thing, but the first thing that we care about that Aptainer does is that it takes a new file system and mounts it uh, into the, the, the uh, host file system. And so that's all well and good, but now you've just got a bunch of files sitting there on your host file system. So how does it actually present that file system as a new root file system to the processes which are inside? And to do that, it creates a new um, mount namespace and it pivots into that. That's basically a cheroot. Cheroot, a, a cheroot has been around for a really long time. It's kind of a precursor to modern um, containers. So uh, they're actually, I think there's even a command cheroot, right? Yeah. yeah. So you can just use actually the command cheroot to do that process that I just said, to create a new root file system for your process. Um, in your case, you've got dollar sign capital cheroot, and that points to a path. And that's saying this is where my cheroot is. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it's, the term's kind of overloaded a little bit. There's like, you know, but, but that's what it's saying. <clears throat> okay. How are we feeling? We could take a step back and chill out and talk about building containers and filling some gaps. Or we could be adventurous. And we could take a step forward and we could go further down this rabbit hole of making um, applications appear as though they're installed on your system. So which way do we, but that's, I'm gonna tell you right now, that one is a little bit more strenuous. If you're tired and you're already kind of overloaded as far as information, you might not pick all that up. So. I think both of them are there in, in the file. They're both, yeah, they're both there. Let's go for the tougher, than, tougher one then. Okay, all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have elected a leader. No, okay. What does everybody think? Um, the, do we want the tougher option? One, two, three, four. Yeah, okay. Or do we want to go back and fill in some gaps on, you want both. <laughs> okay. 
to. Documentation for building a container is pretty thorough. Thank you, Dave Bravo. I I can't take sole responsibility for that. The document <laughs> the documentation is a um community effort. Um, let me go to container docs. Okay, if you want to learn more about building a container, go online. Here's the Aptainer documentation. And I would suggest there's a section here called build a container, and there's a section here called the definition file. These are your pointers. These are where, this is where you need to go. So build a container is going to give you all the commands and all the stuff that you can do with your environment and probably more stuff than you really need. And the definition file is going to go through every single section of a definition file that you could possibly have and what they all do. It's very exhaustive. You contact Rose at CIQ. <laughs> well, what about like the, um, the Aptainer Slack channel? Is that like the best place to kind of go? And yeah, 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 yeah. So um, if you go back to, if you go back to the, the top of this, wherever it's at. Actually, I could have just clicked home. I spent all this time putting all this navigation in and I never use it. Um, so if you just click to home here, there's a link, there's a, a list of links here that, that can be helpful for you. Um, so you can go to the Aptainer home, which is where I just went to get documentation. You can go to GitHub, um, but there's also a Slack workspace, and there's a bunch of people there, including me, who sort of lurk and you know people ask questions and we try to answer them. Um, and then there's also there's a mail there's a Google Groups, but it's kind of I don't think anybody really uses it anymore. Slack is kind of eating its lunch. Yes, and then you can also contact CIQ. Um, I should have said that this is just, like this is a little two hour training um, in which I'm going over a couple sections. Um, I, can, I have given up to three six hour days of intensive Aptainer training and I, I can do that, you know, uh, pretty much at the drop of a hat. If, so if, if anybody actually needs some more intensive, not just like user, but also admin level training of Aptainer, or if you just want like a couple days, you want to go into like deep dive or just a single six hour session or whatever, contact CIQ and we can set something up for you. Okay. All right. So we're going to press on. We're going to go to faking a native installation within an Aptainer container. Um, all right. So this is the approach. So when I was at the NIH, um, I basically convinced the other staff scientists who were there, who were helping to administer applications on behalf of users, that this was the best way to install applications moving forward. Um, at the NIH, there's over a thousand different applications which are currently administered by the staff. So, and they've moved pretty much exclusively to this as the method that they install new applications. So this is like something that's used extensively in the real world. Um, and uh, you can use it too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create, normally when you install an application on bare metal, it goes into a directory hierarchy. You'll have like, you know, especially, well, under Linux it's usually a little bit different. But if you're like in a, uh, a high-performance computing environment, you'll usually put it under a place like opt or maybe user local apps or something. You'll have a, a directory where all your installed software goes. And then you'll name the, the software and then you'll give it a version. And then underneath of that, there's usually like some special directories like bin where the binaries live, maybe source for where you got the source code from, maybe like lib or libexec if there's libraries and stuff like that. It kind of, there's a kind of a specific um, directory hierarchy. So we're going to go ahead and create that, but instead of creating it with like a binary in bin, we're going to create it in such a way that it'll call binaries inside the container, and it'll be very, very tricky. And when we're done, the user who ultimately uses this won't even have to know that Linux containers exist. They won't know that they're a thing. And they will use all these containerized programs happily, blissfully unaware that everything is being virtualized on their behalf. So that's the beauty of this. So you, as an administrator, if somebody comes to you and gives you something really hard to install that you're like, oh my god, I don't know how to install this, no big deal. Just install it inside of a container 
and then just cram it all in this, in this directory structure that allows your users to use it. Don't tell them it's containerized, they'll never know. All right, that's, that's what we're gonna try to do here. So to do this, I'm gonna start off by creating this directory hi hierarchy. And I'm just gonna follow along with exactly what this does. I'm gonna copy and paste so I don't deviate at all so that none of us get lost and we can just do exactly the same thing. I'm gonna CD first to home, just to make sure that everybody's in the same place. You just type CD and then enter. And then I'm just gonna copy that command, make directory, PV says um, do it recursively, so if the parent directory doesn't already exist, make sure it does exist. And then V says do it verbosely so I can see it happening. Okay. Now we're going to go back over and we're going to CD bang money. This is my favorite little bashism because it says bang money says what's the last argument that you gave me? Just take that argument and it just says CD to the directory you just made. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's not, so it's not going to work. It'll work in bash. So I think it, you're probably running bash on Unix. So okay. yeah, it should work on your Mac. Yeah. The Mac is not Unix, by the way. The Mac is, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole thing. It's, it's Darwin, but um, it's Unix-like. Okay, so then we're going to make a couple more directories called libexec and bin. And those are just going to be right here in our current working directory. So we've got now bin and libexec. Okay. And now, you don't have to do this, but I'm just going to give you like a view of what's going on here. Uh, just yeah, two. So if I do ls-l right here, I can see I've got this, this directory called lol cow install. Oops, tree is not found. Yeah. Yeah, don't do this. Just watch me. Oops. No, no. I don't know what that is. I don't want to install that. It's in the rocky uh, mirror, so I'm sure it's fine. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and do tree. This is what my directory structure should look like. I've got LOL cal, the version, and then underneath that I've got bin and libexec, okay? All right, so let me um, CD into libexec. You can just do libexec if you didn't follow me. I gotta do this mess here to get to it, but either way, let's end up in libexec. Okay, libexec is a directory where you would usually put like helper stuff helper binaries that are not really the program that you want your user to run, but they're gonna run on your, pro on your user's behalf. That's what libexec is for. I'm gonna go ahead and pull um, my container to this libexec and I'm going to call it app.sif, and that's to underscore that you can do this with any application you want. It doesn't have to be LOL cal. This is generic. So I'm going to call this container app.sif, okay? Okay, now I'm going to create a wrapper script. Um, in this, don't do this. Don't follow this. In this, I usually do this with more time and I go through step by step every bit of what this wrapper script is going to be doing. Um, and that's why I do it stepwise like this. What this should end up looking like is this. And if we have time, I'll go back and I'll talk about what this is actually doing. But for right now, just copy this text. Use nano, probably, but your favorite text editor, and call it uh, uh, wrapper.sh. Okay, so we're going to call this wrapper.sh. And then once we're there, we're just going to copy those contents there. Now, what is this wrapper.sh script doing? I'm going to go through it really quick while you're trying to make it exact and make sure that everything's good. 
it's basically saying, what's my name? Okay? I'm surprised that Rose is not laughing right now. Like, what's my name? That's what the <laughs> That's what the wrapper script is doing. It's saying command equals base name zero. That's who I am. That's what my name is. Okay, so it's like trying to figure out what its name is. Well, you know already its name is wrapper.sh, so that's, that's no big deal. But the magic of this script is if you symlink another command to it, its name changes. And so when you create symlinks to this wrapper script, that CMD is going to change to something different. If you don't understand that right off the bat, don't worry about it. I'm going to illustrate in a few minutes. And then it just says, what's my name? Where am I? What arguments has the user provided? And what's the name of the image I'm supposed to run? And then it says, OK, you want me to execute an apptainer command. Oh, man, this is only going to. Here, let's get rid of these quotes here. Let's actually just execute it. It's going to say, OK, you want me to execute an apptainer command. And that, that command, that the image, is going to be in the same directory that I am. It's going to be that image you just told me about, app.sif. It's going to be whatever my name is. That's the thing I should run. And then it's going to run with whatever arguments the user gives me. OK. So now what we're going to do Actually, um, we're going to edit that script a little bit. So go into that script again, and we're going to add one more thing here. We're going to bind data. Now, the user who's running this doesn't know about containers, so they sure don't know about bind paths. So they don't know that they have to you know, tell this application that it has to be able to see slash scratch or slash data or slash whatever. They just want it to work. So this is how you can control that. And in fact, um, there's other, you can put whatever options you want in here. Um, if this is a GPU, enabled container, for instance. You could put an environment variable here that says, run this container with the dash dash nv command that makes the GPU work on the user's behalf without them knowing they have to pass a special command to make it work. So you can really you know, tailor this uh, to the needs of the user. OK. Now, we're going to go down here and we're going to create some symlinks. We're going to cd to our bin directory. Because now, these are the things that, so bin is the directory we actually want to put on our user's path. So you could install this underneath of LMOD. And when the module gets loaded, you could add this bin directory to your user's path. And so now, all of a sudden, whatever's in here, the user has access to. And I'm going to make some symlinks. And the symlinks are going to be of this syntax. They're all going to be symlinked to that wrapper.sh. And I'm going to symlink our good old um, programs that we've been running this entire time. Fortune, Calse, and LOLcat. I am linking three different commands to the same script. And remember that this script if you make a symlink to it, that CMD environment variable in the script is going to change. So it says, what's my name? Oh, my name is Kause. You must run, want me to run Kause inside the container. What's my name? My name's Fortune. You want, must want me to run Fortune inside the container. All right, so let me, I'm going to CD back up one directory. Um, Actually, let me CD up a few more directories. Just one. I don't know where I'm at anymore. CD up, up. OK. This is what this installation should look like. We've got a, uh, a version number, so we can install multiple different versions of this if we had multiple different versions. 
We've got a bin and a lib exec directory, and we have all these sim links here, which point to the wrapper script, which points to the, the uh, container. And so now, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you don't have to do the tree. I just, I installed the tree myself, but you could do, if you wanted to, sudo dnf install tree. Uh, one question. So, in a wrapper dot if you put uh, the app dinner bind path as data layer, but you don't have any data here. Is it outside? Uh, I do have data right here. Oh. Remember, I created that slash data directory? Oh, because it is at slash. It's somewhere else entirely. It's at the root. So it's at, uh, it's up here. But that, that slash data is going to appear inside the container. So we can access that data uh, by doing this. All right, so now here is the, like the big thing. Here's the big reveal, if it works. Um, I should be able to do lol cow install the version bin and then cow say <laughs> and that's because wrapper.sh is not executable. So let me change that. Chamad 750. Uh, because I've done this before and gotten the same error before. So and what if you had not done that before? Then? You'd spend the next 15 to 30 minutes banging your head on your computer and then <laughs> say, wow, what a, what a dummy I am. <laughs> All right, so lolcal.install uh, libexec, nope, version, libexec wrapper. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm setting my permissions so that I have read, write, and execute. Anybody in my group just has read and execute, and anybody on the system has read and execute. That's what 755 means. That's, well, what is the role? that's part of bash. Yeah. What is the role of the sh chmod? Chmod, ch um, it, it modifies permissions, change permissions. Yes, and that's um, octal. So yeah, it gets it gets into yeah yeah, it's bits. Oh. Yeah yeah yeah. That that's I'm not going to cover that in this class. <laughs> yeah. All right. In any case, so now if I do tree, that should be executable. Let's try my magic command again. Ha. Huh. Oh, uh, the color change just means that I haven't catted that to. Oh, okay. But let me not do that right now because I can make this even easier. Export path equals home. I'm going to add this binary path, this bin path, to the front of my path. And now if I say which cow say, oh, it's right there. Which fortune, it's right there. And now I can do our good old and it all just works. I'm sorry, what does that bar number? That's a pipe. And that says take the standard input from the previous command and just use it as input to the next command. Okay. Yeah. So let's back, before we ask any more questions, let's once again try to get the high level, uh, the high level thing of what we just did here. So I could pass this off if I had another user on the system and I could say, hey, just add this path to the beginning of your path and all of a sudden now you, you can run Fortune, Cal, say, and LOL cat or, you know, whatever, like uh, whatever I install, you could run all that stuff. Um, so now another user, and they don't have to know what Linux containers are. Like I can do these commands and I don't have to use Aptain or anything. They just run, you know. You can install stuff on your system that you don't actually want to like DNF install or you don't want to sudo DNF install. You can just install it locally on your system like this. And when you're done with it, you can just delete this entire directory hierarchy and not worry about it anymore. 
So this is a nice, clean way to use containers um, without having to run any container commands at all. So if you del it won't work anymore if you delete the directory. So I, like I'm saying, if you're so a lot of times I don't want to pollute my bare metal laptop by installing a bunch of stuff because it's going to go in, you know, I don't know where user local bin, uh, user Etsy, all these different places where I don't want it to go, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to cleanly get rid of it again afterward. So instead, you can just install it like this, and then when you're done with it, you can just delete the entire directory hierarchy and remove every single trace of it from your system, like it was never there. This is kind of, so if you guys know Ubuntu, Ubuntu um, has gone to a kind of a newish package manager called Snaps. This is, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's kind of similar in spirit to the way that Snaps work. So Snaps are actually little squash FS file systems which come down and, and run as containers pretty much. Um, and they have pass-throughs, like that Aptainer um, bind path uh, environment variable, which allow them to read and write data off the host system and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's similar. Those are a lot more advanced than this, but it's the basic idea. Yeah, yeah, so what happens is, yeah, I should go back through it again. Now that we've seen it, I should go back through. Um, so let's go through line by line what the script does. When I call it with, let's say, cow say, this CMD equals so this, this little thing here is a bashism, and it says, whatever the standard output of this command is, allow me to use that. And in this case, I'm setting an environment variable to that. So it says CMD is going to equal this command base name with, this is a special environment variable, dollar sign zero, which always refers to itself. So if you just do dollar sign zero, you're going to get the full path of whatever it is. And base name strips the directory off and just gets the command. So that's everything that that line's doing. And so when I run this with um, the symlink calsay that points to it, CMD ends up being calsay. Or the actual calsay. No, it ends up being the text calsay. CMD ends up being a variable and its contents are the text calsay. The directory um, uses a different approach to get the current directory where the wrapper script is. This is just a pretty robust way of saying where am I. So dear ends up being the location, uh, home, student, uh, lol cow, dot install, v0.0.1, um, libexec. That's what that ends up being. <coughs> arg, this syntax, um, dollar at wrapped in quotes takes whatever input I gave to that command and just puts it into arg. It just transposes it directly. And that's a kind of a special syntax in that it doesn't mess up quotes or do anything like that. It just takes it as it is and just sends it directly into that environment variable. And that's how I can do like cal say moo and it still works. Um, and then image, this is just hard coded to say app.sif. Um, so if I change the name of that image, this wouldn't work anymore. I'd have to change it here, too. And then, you know what this does. And then down here, it's just taking, it's saying, execute in the same, it's making the assumption that that container is going to be in the same directory with the script. So it's saying, execute in that directory, that image, cmd, or, uh, sorry, app.sif. Give it whatever name I'm named. In this case, it would be calsay and pass all the same arguments to Calsay or Fortune or LOLcat or whatever else. We're going to have to wrap up. Okay. We've got another class coming. That's it. 420. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I will refrain. Another class in 10 minutes. Okay. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Yeah, you're quite welcome. <laughs>